is Hal Varian. I'm the chief economist here at Google. And it's my great pleasure to introduce my uh, friend and colleague, Glenn Hubbard, who was named dean of Columbia Business School on July 1st, 2004. So he's been a dean for nine years. As a former dean, I can tell you that's a lot of fortitude. I'm very impressed. Uh, he's been a Columbia, Columbia faculty member since 1980, 1988, and he's the Russell L. Carson Professor of Finance and Economics. He holds AM and PhD degrees in economics from Harvard University. In addition to writing more than 100 scholarly articles in economics and finance, he's the author of two leading textbooks on money and financial markets, as well as an author co-author of several other books. And his commentaries appear frequently in Business Week, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Financial Times, Washington Post, and several other publications. In government, Professor Hubbard served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Treasury Department for Tax Policy from 1991 to 1993, and he was also Chairman of the U.S. Council of Economic Advisors under President George uh, W. Bush. So uh, when we invited him to come out, I explained that this was uh, Halloween or nearly Halloween week. And I said, when you come, wear an outfit that's really kind of different and scary. <clears throat> and so he said, I know, I'll wear the outfit from when I was at the uh, tax policy group. And sure enough, it gave me a start when I saw it. So, Glenn. Yeah, apologies uh, in advance for being dressed like a banker, uh, being before you. I have a lot of Columbia events while I am uh, out here. It's a real treat uh, to get to talk about uh, balance with you. And I'll say a bit, but I, you know, I'm happy, happiest if we have a conversation uh, about it. I'll say a little bit about what um, the book isn't and what it is uh, at the beginning. What it isn't is yet another declinist screed from an economist, historian, political science about what's wrong with America. That's not what the book is. What it is is a fantastic Christmas gift. If you want to buy 500 copies, give it to all your friends. That, that's just terrific. And I should say that unless you want to talk with me about short-term policy issues in Q&A, this is going to be really a book about the long view. I mean, George Bush once said about me that, you know, Glenn can't even predict the past. And I think what he meant by that was data get revised, but I'm not gonna sit here and talk about forecasts over the year, I'll do whatever you want in Q&A, but that's not why I'm here. I wrote the book Balance with a, a fellow economist named uh, Tim Kaine, uh, because it helped me go back to why I became an economist in the first place. I was very interested, as I explained to freshmen, whenever I teach freshman economics, in the following question. Why isn't the whole world rich? It, it sounds like a simple question. It's actually devilishly hard. We know there are enormous gaps over time and place in wealth. And where do those come from? And in a lot of my own work as an economist, like many economists, I've tried to focus on sources of growth. You know, what ignites prosperity? This book has a slightly different take. It's the, the mirror, the, the flip side of that. It's about what happens when growth stops. Basically, we know we have episodes where economies grow for very long periods of time and become great powers, and then that growth either decelerates sharply or stops. And, and what do we know about that? What, what do economists have to say about great power decline? Now, I come at this from two perspectives. One is history, and I'll say a little bit about that. But the, what I'll talk a little bit more about is the contemporary United States, because this is obviously a topic that's on the mind not just of economists, but policymakers and many average folks in our country of where we're heading and what growth uh, is likely to be. And to start and, and frame the idea with you, let's suppose that rather than sitting here today, we were getting together about 100 years ago. So it's 1913, and we're on the eve of the First World War. And if you were to look at what per capita income was in industrial countries in today's dollars, that would have been typically about $3,000 in 1913. That number is obviously much higher today, which tells you about growth we've experienced in the past century. If you were lucky enough to be an American or a Brit, that 3,000 number was about 4,000. Now let's turn the clock back. So it's not 1913 anymore. It's uh, year 1000 in the common era. 
If you were to look at the same numbers, again, today's dollars, so we're comparing apples to apples, that number would have been about $400, which tells you, again, there was growth in the intervening period. But here's where I want to start with you. Let's turn the clock way back. So not to 1913 and not to the year 1000, but to Rome at the time of Caesar Augustus. In that period in Rome, the prosperity in the core areas of what was in the Roman Empire was actually greater than the prosperity a thousand years after. Now that's kind of hard to understand because you know, typically we think that there can be slowdowns in growth, slowdowns in productivity, maybe slowdowns in technology, but that kind of um, absolute regress on a very grand scale for a very long period of time can be hard to understand. Now, this is a familiar topic, and indeed, Paul Kennedy, who is a very famous historian, wrote a book, some of you may have seen, about 25 years ago, uh, called The Rise and Decline of Great Powers. And Kennedy had in mind connecting essentially the same points I'm going to try to connect with you. What happened to Rome and what might happen to America today. And in Kennedy's view, if you looked at great power decline, whether that was ancient Rome, the British Empire, which would have been the most recent preeminent power before America, and America today, it was all about military overstretch. So Kennedy had this very, very elaborate overstretch thesis. And indeed, what caught me about his book, and the reason I was somewhat skeptical as an economist, was the cover. So if you look at the cover of Kennedy's book, it's a globe. And it has stairs that are going up and down the globe. And if you look at who's already tripped and fallen almost to the floor, it's John Bull, who's the symbol of the United Kingdom. Already starting to stumble a little bit, but not having fallen all the way down, is Uncle Sam, symbol of the United States. Who do you suppose is rising up the stairs very confidently? Now keep in mind, I told you this book was written 25 years ago. A Japanese salaryman, right? So coming up the stairs, this view that Japan was necessarily going to eat the lunch of other countries. I think many economists at the time, including myself, were a little skeptical of that because it's one thing to have a growth catch up to the frontier. It's quite another to shift the frontier. And query, was the Japanese model set up for that? Now, it's not just Kennedy and historians that were looking maybe through a, a different lens at economic power, no less an economic lion than Paul Samuelson himself in his very famous and best-selling Principles of Economics book, had for many, many editions a date at which the Soviet Union's economy would overtake the United States. Now, what was interesting was with each edition, the date kept moving out. And on or around 1989, the reference got dropped. So it's not just historians. So someone who's great and as smart as Paul Samuelson was essentially falls into the same thing. Now, one of the places where Tim and I start the book is with a kind of fundamental question of what does it mean to have economic power? What does that mean as an economist, not as a politician? And we argue that leaders in many times in history have been confused about the sources of wealth and economic power. And in some cases, interest groups are not confused at all, but simply manage to redistribute resources to themselves. To make it simple, because this is a book written for popular consumption, not for economists, we go back to the intuition of what I would call three great S uh, economists, uh, Smith and Solo and Schumpeter. So in Smith, I think about the scale or size of an economy, what we today would call GDP or something like that. Solo's views about investment and future orientation. And of course, the Schumpeterian view of the frontier and the process that would generate innovation that moves the frontier. All of those are sources of economic power. In the book, we actually develop sort of a trivial point if you're interested, it's their kind of index of economic power looking across place and time using the Penn world data. Uh, the United States is definitely by almost any such measure the preeminent economic power. I don't think that's controversial. What I'm about to say is a little more controversial. We think it's likely to remain the preeminent economic power for a considerable period of time. 
One of the countries that's often talked about today, much as the Japanese salaryman in Paul Kennedy's example, is of course China. China is growing very rapidly, as is often happens in uh, pronounced catch-up phases. It's very difficult, though, to pivot from that to frontier-producing growth, particularly in an economy whose financial system, whose rule of law is not oriented toward that. So we can come back to this if you like, but Tim and I would count ourselves among the skeptics of China immediately overtaking the United States in, in uh, economic power. So let's have a look at Rome. Kennedy's thesis, again, was that Rome spent too much on its military. It was too adventuresome. Now, like all stories, there is an element of truth to that. We argue that what really killed Rome was understretch. We point to a series of examples in the book, starting from the famous Hadrian's Wall and the idea of walling in Rome to stop immigration. Does this sound familiar in current policy debates? Um, debasing its currency, pursuing policies that favored the present over the future, including fiscal policy and what would be the equivalent of monetary policy. Rome's understretch over a period of time led to its rot far more than its military adventure. And this is a pattern you actually see with many great power declines. Just to give you a quick uh, tour of Dory Zongs, I really want to focus mainly on America today, but we have a look at Ming China, for example, which was in its day the commercial envy of the world. You know, virtually every school kid learns of the voyages of Cheng Ho, at least in the transliteration of my schoolboy days. And those voyages were to establish the great merchant class of China with shipping. The only problem, of course, much like a Praetorian guard in Rome usurped power for itself, People surrounding the emperor were not too fond of the fact that merchants and shipping folks were gaining political and economic power in the country and eventually persuade the emperor not only to decrease that commercial activity, but literally burn the ships. Growth stops, regress happens, not because the Chinese forgot how to build ships or forgot how to do commerce, but because a, a political institution couldn't keep up with the economic changes facing China. Another case study we look at is Imperial Spain. You know, oftentimes when we hear the phrase, the sun will never set, people commonly think of that as being a story about the British Empire. The quote is actually about Spain. Spain in its day was the preeminent empire. But Spanish leaders were very confused about what economic power is and where it came from. They thought it was gold and silver, the mercantile policies pursued by Spain were toward the advancement of gold and silver and not toward the kinds of commerce and innovation that would lead to true growth. Spain also pursued a very present-oriented policy, defaulting many times on its debt, and an empire that at its height seemed to span the world simply rotted away. We look at the case of the Ottoman Empire, which often, you know, every school kid is taught that was the sick man of Europe. Not really true. If you look at the origins of the Ottoman Empire, it was an administrative marvel. Much like the Praetorian Guards of Rome or the court eunuchs surrounding the emperor in China, there were a group called Janissaries that were slaves who rose to be leaders. The Grand Vizier himself was always from this core. And they were an administrative marvel until they decided that the technological developments happening threatened their power base vis-a-vis -vis the Sultan and again, much has happened in Imperial China or Imperial Rome killed it off. Just to mention a few other case studies we look at, we look at the British Empire, which seems to be the archetype for Kennedy's case. After all, World War I and World War II were exhausted, exhausting for Britain, uh, particularly because it was having to defend an empire uh, all over the world. But we argue that part of the seeds of British problems went back to an incident on or around 1776 uh, involving the United States where Britain was insufficiently British with folks outside of Britain. That lack of outwardness, even though inside Britain was a classic liberal open policy, the British did not follow that policy in their colonies. The most celebrated example of that failure is the United States, but it happened many times in the British colonial experience. We look at Japan uh, after the war. 
uh, through the lens of the game of Go, which is a very hard game to play. At the beginning of Go, almost it's a board game. Almost anything is possible. At the end, the conclusion is certainly known. In the middle is where life is interesting. And we, all, we argue in the book that that's really what Japan pursued as the arc during the war. The, uh, after the war, the uh, growth and catch-up phase was very, very impressive, but has stalled out relative to the American frontier uh, in the past two decades. A part of that is from bad macroeconomic policy, but part of that are from real structural barriers and failure to understand economic power. We also look at the Eurozone, and one other example I will mention uh, is the state of California. As a New Yorker, I sometimes think of California as a foreign country, and I group it in with the other uh, examples. But you know, California is interesting because it is the only part of the world outside of the Mediterranean that has the climate, the wonderful climate of the Mediterranean. It's the only large land mass that has that. It, however, shares something else with the Mediterranean, which is a political system that can look fairly dysfunctional. And the Praetorian Guards that I talked about from Rome are reconstituted in California in a variety of interest groups, including public workers' unions. And so in each of these cases, a fantastically successful rich society is held back from where it might be. Now, I want to talk about the contemporary United States. And I, I have this sort of historical buildup with you uh, to now pivot a little bit to economics because I think there's a view many people have, particularly many people in my profession in economics, that what's facing the nation are a series of technical problems. So for example, uh, I'm going to talk with you about debt. How do we devise technical solutions? In none of the historical cases, and certainly I will argue with you not in what faces America today, is the problem a lack of economic knowledge. It is not a lack of technical issues. There are plenty of smart economists, business people, policymakers on both sides uh, of the aisle. Rather, the point, as in each of the historical case studies, is that the political rules of the game don't facilitate that technical solution. Now, let me do a build up and be more specific. So in the US, one of the key examples we've seen in the recent weeks is the battle over the future of debt in the country. So we all know we've had politicians playing matches with matches in the Capitol and the White House. And part of this is, well, maybe it's political theater or short-term game, Democrats versus Republicans. It's actually a more fundamental structural problem. What has happened in the country, and in much of the industrial world, also particularly in Europe and, and Japan, is the very large run-up in central government debt uh, relative uh, to GDP. Uh, this is a real problem. Uh, there was a debate around the publication of Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff's book, This Time is Different, about whether there exists a tipping point that if a debt to GDP ratio gets at a particular level, bad things happen. I don't think any economist can honestly tell you there's a number. I can't tell you that at 80% or 90% or you pick your number, bad things happen. But I can tell you a bit of arithmetic that by definition this rising debt to GDP ratio will cause higher tax burdens in the future and will cause spending adjustments on much of what the public thinks government does. Defend the country, educate children, conduct basic research. We've seen this experiment run in many industrial economies that simply can't project themselves in the way that fast growth economies uh, used to be. Now, to understand why this isn't a technical problem, a little bit of history is in order. So let's do an experiment together. Suppose I asked you, go back to the time of the American Revolution and then go to 1970 and tell me about the shape of the federal debt to GDP ratio. Not the numbers, just the shape. Like up, down, flat, anybody. Any conjectures what it looks like? Revolution to 1970. Exactly. It is entirely, yeah, it's entirely a story of war and peace. If you look at every major debt buildup episode in the country, and by the way, I could have said Britain or France uh, to you, it's true of most industrial countries, we build up debt in war, 
we're borrowing to finance the war, which is actually good fiscal policy to do. And after a war, we stop spending so much and we grow, so both the numerator and the denominator are kicking in. Uh, to give you just a quick example of that, at the close of World War II, America's debt to GDP ratio was in excess of 100%. That number was 40% by 1960. Just stopping the military spending and rapid post-war growth brought it back into line. Now take that same experiment. So we talked about the revolution to the time of, say, 1970. Now let's, for any industrial country, look at 1970 to the present. Any difference in what the picture looks like? Yeah, basically it's, the, first of all, mechanically what's happening is there are a few hills and valleys, but they're small relative to the war and peace years, and it sort of goes straight up. Now, it, it's really not Kennedy's view. For example, I'm not a foreign policy expert, so I can't tell you whether America's military interventions in the past decade or so have been wise or unwise, but I can tell you as a bean counter or as an economist, they're not the problem. So military spending has fallen sharply as a share of the economy decade after decade following uh, the Second World War. The current debate in the country is really whether military spending ought to be, say, 3% of GDP or maybe 4% of GDP, but that's the gating. The entitlement programs, the social welfare programs, particularly Social Security and Medicare, are much, much larger. And what we've seen since the late 60s, early 70s, is an explosion in growth in these programs. So if you look at shares of GDP and components of federal spending, most of what, if you went and polled people on the street and say, what does government do, defense, education, what goes in Washington is discretionary spending, that's all sharply down relative to GDP. What has gone up many, many fold is Medicare and Social Security. So Medicare is about 1% of GDP, 1970. It's about 6% and rising. With Social Security and Medicare together, the Congressional Budget Office tells us that just 20 years from now, if we don't make any changes, we'll spend about 10 percentage points of American GDP more on just those two programs than we do today. And if the whole tax share in GDP, even in the best of times, is a number like 18, 19%, I think you can see the scale of the problem. Now, here's the rub. What I've said so far is just facts, and I don't think serious people dispute those facts. But I think the general consensus is we just haven't found the right technical solution. Nobody's come up with the right way either to change those programs or raise taxes or cut something else. You can do the arithmetic in your head uh, on what's needed. Uh, I don't think that's, uh, that's accurate. Uh, th there are plenty of ways to restore long-term fiscal balance. The levers are familiar. They involve program changes, other spending changes, tax increases, or the promotion of growth and hundreds of policies fall into those combined buckets. So that's not really the issue. Rather, I think we've got to learn from three things. One is uh, this classic economist joke. The second is the game of basketball. And the third is the book, The Odyssey. Now, the classic economist joke always troubles me because I am the classic economist. And you've probably all heard the classic economist joke, but I'll repeat it to make my point. So you have a chemist and a physicist and an economist who are marooned uh, on a desert island, and a can of soup or stew washes ashore. And the physicist says, um, let's beat it open and we'll eat it. The chemist says, no, you know, that's a little bit messy. Why don't we heat it? It will open and we'll eat it and it'll be warm to boot. And the economist says, assume a can opener. Right? That's the painful joke for economists. Now, the problem with what we're looking at in the current situation is we're assuming a good government. We're assuming the political process can deliver the right outcome. We simply haven't put in the right technical inputs. That was not true in any of the historical case studies, nor, I would argue, is it true for the contemporary United States. And here's where basketball comes in. So in the 1930s, the game of basketball, obviously a very popular sport, uh, nearly died uh, as a sport of great spectator interest. And the reason, if you go back to books at that time, was what was called the tall man problem. Now, this was a period in which there was no shot clock in basketball and there was no three-point shot, so the game looked a little different than today. 
And what would happen is if you were the team with the tallest guys, they could simply hang around the hoop and dominate play. Now that's great if you're the team with the tall men. It's not so much fun to watch, and the sport was in trouble. Now enter a man named Howard Hobson. Howard Hobson was the basketball coach of the University of Oregon. He comes to my attention because he's actually writing a PhD thesis at Columbia. Now I would note this was an era where basketball coaches got PhDs at, at Columbia and other institutions. And his, his PhD thesis is a book called Scientific Basketball, which I recommend to any of you, where he makes cogently the argument for a three-point shot. Eventually, there's an experimental game between Columbia and Fordham in the mid-1940s. Columbia wins. Over time, Hobson's idea works its way into college ball, eventually to pro ball. And of course, a much more familiar name, Michael Jordan, can sort of trace his success back to this man. I raise this point with you for a simple illustration. Sometimes, whether you're talking about a very successful society or a very successful game, when there's an adaptation, you have to change the rules. So if we can't assume a good government, and a byproduct of that is we may think we need to change the rules, what would that rule change be? Well, here's the story from the Odyssey that I love. It's the story of the sirens. So in the story of the sirens, it's a story of temptation. It's a story of leadership and of joy. In the story, of course, our leader has the men put wax in their ears and row. Remember, the sirens have this beautiful music, very physically appealing. The only problem is if you follow their way, let's just say bad things happen to you. And so what our leader wants to do is have the men row past with wax in their ears, but he wants the benefit of the siren song. How does he get it? He lashes himself to the mast. He's able to get the benefit because he has absolutely had to change the rules to constrain his own behavior. Now, if you go back to the debt dynamic uh, in industrial countries uh, for the moment that I started with, we know we don't have a self-correcting mechanism. Before, we had war and peace, which were essentially self-correcting budget mechanisms. And much of the rules we have around the budget from the founders on were written with that in mind. So for example, what we fight over in the past couple of weeks, the so-called debt limit negotiations, the debt limit comes out of World War I. It's an idea that before World War I, the Congress had to vote literally on every bond issue. And the idea was that since things were self-correcting, why not have these periodic allowances for borrowing, i.e. when you're fighting a war, because that's what borrowing meant in those days, and it would allow the Congress not to constantly do this. Now, of course, that works if you have a natural adjustment where debt comes down at some subsequent date. But as I've told you, that is not what's happening, not only in the US, but in other industrial countries. And we may need to think about changing the rules. Tim and I offer a couple of potential rule changes. One, which I would call a light rope uh, in the Odyssey example, would be to take the programs that are at issue which are these big social insurance programs, and treat the accounting much more like you would in a business. And so in a business, if I decide to promise people more in the future on something, or there's a change in accrued liabilities, that's not something that's in the ether. It shows up in my financial statements today, and it has to be accounted for and paid for. So one could say to the Congress, look, it's not that everything is on budget. But the change in the accrued liabilities of these programs is an expense. You'll put it on the budget, and you have to go to the American people and say, we'd like to raise taxes to pay for this, or we'd like to cut some other spending. You pick how to pay for it. Or maybe we'll reform those programs, but force the choice to be made. Tim and I argue at the present time, we have a kind of political prisoner's dilemma game where if one party simply wants lower taxes and another party wants high spending, with the current budget rules, there's an unfortunate equilibrium. It's just called debt accumulation. Both parties can get what they want. But ultimately, of course, that's not stable. There is a tighter uh, binding of rope. And it's a spending limitation. Now, in the book, we argue, as I think most economists do, that literal balanced budget amendments of the type that have been considered are fundamentally flawed. They are hard to implement, particularly around business cycles. You don't want the government exacerbating a business cycle. But it doesn't mean that you can't design something. We put out a simple example. There, there are many, many others. You could imagine a spending limitation 
that says government spending as a share GDP is limited to the moving average of some number of years. The example we use is seven years of inflation adjusted revenue. So getting rid of the inflation effect. I pick seven because it's the number in Pharaoh's dream, but if you like six, eight, ten, doesn't matter, some long period of time. That's the way typically most endowments, for example, work in a university or any large philanthropic organization. And we would allow the Congress to deviate from that whenever it wants, but only with escalating super majorities every time it deviates. Now note the difference in this kind of approach from what's often discussed. First of all, it's a long period of time. You don't have the cyclical problem. We also don't have a bias as to economists as to whether the solution is raising taxes or cutting spending. I think that's a political choice, and the American people have every right to make that choice as long as they know that one of those or some combination is the choice. So we think this kind of a rule change um, may, help, uh, may help a great deal. But just to kind of close uh, where, where I began, I see that we're in this discussion at a kind of fork in the road. And you can see the fork in the road going back to the historical case studies, whether they're about Kennedy and military or about what we're talking about in the intersection of politics and economics. And I would like you to imagine behind me as if there were two pictures to illustrate this. One is Agatha Christie and the other is Ben Franklin. Now Agatha Christie is one of my favorite writers. I like murder mysteries. I, I like stories that happen in ex exotic places involving posh guests. That's a typical Agatha Christie murder mystery. And the example that I would use to il illustrate this is the story And Then There Were None. And Then There Were None, like a typical Christie story, starts with a dinner party in a mansion with a group of posh folks. And then a murder happens. And it actually puts kind of a damper on the evening when that happens. But pretty soon, people come back to the dinner party and enjoying themselves, except there's another murder. And you can see, given the title of the book, where this is headed, and, and then there were none. Now, what's interesting to me about this, the economics of great power failure and the economics of growth stoppages, they tend to look like, and then there were none. It's not some single act of military overreach. Rather, it's a series of political mistakes of missing something in the economic environment and failing to act until they're none. An alternative view in this fork in the road, a more optimistic view, is actually Franklin's. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Ben Franklin is his uh, looking at the Constitutional Convention at the chair in which George Washington sat the whole time as the leader of the convention. And carved in the back of that chair that the Washington sat in, was a son, and Franklin said he spent the whole time, certainly not the whole time, but much of the time, wondering whether the sun was rising or setting and concluding it's rising. If you go through all these historical case studies, they're cautionary tales, I would argue, but only that. There is nothing uh, written into the detail of history that suggests a great power has to fail. There is, however, a roadmap of how that failure occurs, and that's the cautionary tale uh, that's the theme of balance. You'll see on the cover pictures of ancient Rome and America that try to, to, tie it, uh, to tie it together. So I'll stop there, but I'd be delighted to uh, take any questions. Okay. So Gordon Krovitz uh, in this week's Wall Street Journal talked about running experiments on policies. Um, and he said, you know, Silicon Valley runs experiments, and, and it's true, right? Most of your web use is actually runs experiments. Uh, and you proposed some rule changes, and we could run experiments to go try to deploy those, deploy those changes. But I don't understand how you would deploy these changes or, or run an experiment to see which rules are, are the right one, because the time frame where I go figure out whether it's a good rule is long. And secondly, it's hard to go measure the impact, right? How do I measure these things? I have to go a bunch of academics and policy wonks, and they all disagree at the end. So can we run experiments to go and try out these rules in various well, places? And if so, how would we do that? It's a great question. I would argue that there's two kinds of experiments, to use your term, that we can look at. One are the, uh, the roles of state rule changes over many decades. 
because states do have much more limits on budgets and have experimented over many years with a variety of spending limitations, capital and current budgets, and so on. And there's a large literature that's learned a great deal about budget balance. There are also two national case studies within the past couple of decades. One is Canada and the other Sweden, where these sorts of budget issues led to fundamental process reforms to right the fiscal ship. So our book isn't so much a book about solutions. There are lots of different ways to do it. But the idea is that you really have to experiment with rule changes. The notion that we could wait for a leader in a, on a white horse of either party uh, or just hope that some smart economist shows up, we just think that's, that's naive. But your, your question is spot on. It's very hard. So I think continuing on that vein, um, you've essentially proposed a technical solution to the current issues that we're facing. But as you mentioned in your talk, a lot of these issues are born from political problems rather than a lack of technical solutions. So how would you go about, for example, changing the rules of the game when the, you know, the political parties or the political actors involved are clearly, it's clearly in their best interest to keep the system as it is? It's, it's a great question. And I would argue we haven't proposed a technical technical solution, as I said, we're agnostic as to what form these limitations take. The right would have one view, the left another. We're outlining a family uh, of rules. But I would say uh, a couple of things. One is that we need to have much more political process competition. Uh, one thing I, I didn't mention, but we talk about in the book, is some unwitting implications of campaign finance reform in the US over the past several decades have led to monopoly powers of two political parties in the process, sort of ossifying competition, making it very difficult to have new budget ideas. We can break that. Uh, the other is the prospect for spending limitations are not as grim as they might appear. 34 states have considered and passed spending limitations um, for the federal level uh, in the past two decades. And twice in that period, one House of Congress passed it. So remember, there are two routes to amendments Congress or states, both of those have been fairly active. So I think this is a topic of, of conversation. You mentioned that uh, the entitle entitlement is the main driver for the debt going up. But I, I assume the uh, entitlement is to offset inequality. But in the meantime, inequality still is widening. So my question is, you know, to solve this problem, do you think it's a technical solution or we need a sort of political process for that? Well, I think that you've mixed a couple of interesting questions in there. I, I don't know that it's the case empirically that the entitlement programs are helping on the inequality front. For example, wealthier people tend to live longer and have higher medical expenditures in old age for a variety of reasons. These programs may even slightly at the margin, even though they were designed with the best of intentions, not be helping so much. Policies to go at inequality, I don't think are so much policies about entitlements as they are policies about education and, and training. So I think there are ways to get at that without the entitlements. One thing that the US could do that would radically lower its entitlement burdens, and this is a technical solution, would be to turn them into safety net programs. So they would be focused on inequality. There would be very strong safety nets for low income Americans, but essentially not part of the life of middle and, and upper income Americans. Uh, that would be a very different world than the one we, we live in. Uh, you mentioned accounting systems for government uh, spending and liabilities. What examples uh, around the world do you know that use general accounting practices or something comparable to that? When and do they do better? We certainly don't have too many examples of governments having the same kind of transparency as the private sector. But the two reforms I mentioned in Canada and Sweden are probably the closest at really being transparent about social welfare obligations and the present value of those obligations. And they were born in a crisis. I mean, one reason I think one has to be worried about the US is while Canada and Sweden did make these changes, they were made in an environment where they absolutely had to. They couldn't borrow money. One of the issues in Washington today is whenever economists like me show up and ring the alarm bell, they say, but look how low interest rates are. We can borrow the money. So it, it becomes harder to do this. We have the examples, but unfortunately, there are not many examples of change made voluntarily as opposed to hitting, hitting the wall. So we don't have any examples of the state or county levels that have implemented this that you're aware of or city? Oh, we certainly do. Yeah, so I say there is a state literature on um, Variance in pension accounting <clears throat> states have very different rules in that. 
One of the things we argue in the book that I didn't mention is while the federal government <coughs> can't legally tell states what to do in their budget, the municipal bond tax exemption is not in the Constitution. It's a creature of law. And so one could say, if you want to borrow in the tax-exempt market, you will conform to these accounting. So actually, there's quite a bit of leverage the federal government has uh, over states that's so far not been exploited. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, to what extent do you think uh, the structure of our monetary system impacts uh, your thesis about our abilities to either drive up and borrow beyond what we otherwise would? You mentioned, for example, that every time an economist comes up and, and raises the alarm, people point to how low interest rates are. Well, it's certainly the case that current U.S. monetary policy has kept interest rates very low. I think in the advent of the financial crisis, or the right after the financial crisis, that was wise, uh, particularly keeping um, spreads between mortgage-backed securities and treasuries low. For what it's worth, I don't think there's much evidence to suggest that lower long-term interest rates as a result of quantitative easing have had a large material effect on the real economy. There, there certainly have had an effect on asset prices, but not a very big effect on the real economy. So I know some argue the Fed is enabling Washington. I don't think that's the Fed's intent, uh, but it, it's certainly a, a, a consequence. Yeah. I'm not clear on what you think was the cause of the shift from war and peace cycles in the debt to ever increasing debt. What, what, where did that come it's from? It's the structure of the entitlement. So basically in the mid 60s is the introduction of the Medicare and Medicaid programs. And it's in 1972 that when Wilbur Mills, who was then chairman of the Ways and Means Committee before he cavorted with a stripper and got thrown out of Washington, he had a policy of double indexing social security benefits. So the real value of those obligations rose sharply. So in a period from between, say, mid-1960s to mid-1970s, we just had enormous structural change in those programs, none of which were recorded on the, on the budget. I mean, the, the liabilities part, the current year spending is, but the accruing of those liabilities wasn't recorded at all. So it is a, almost a, it's not a literal natural experiment, but a sea change in policy. I was curious. I, I think my intent was really in regards to both the dollar status as a, um, the global kind of financial reserve currency and the use of federal debt as the primary um, asset under our standard banking rules. So for example, uh, treasury bills are your unit of account for reserve requirements for everything and they're just kind of a basic building block that you assume right. everything has to operate on. Basically, the U.S. gets an enormous benefit from what Charles de Gaulle called years ago an exorbitant privilege that we have the reserve currency countries. So all over the world, people are willing to hold pieces of paper with Ben Franklin's picture, or they're willing to hold dollar-denominated assets. Uh, that's what's a little bit odd when politicians in Washington trifle with the full faith and credit of the U.S. because it is an enormous positive impact. So from a macro perspective, that's very valuable. It's also the case that we do sometimes get distortions in the financial system from financial repression. I'm not sure if that's where your uh, question was headed by tell, telling financial institutions they need to hold a certain category of instruments as riskless, you know, may distort portfolio holdings. And we certainly are doing that in contemporary bank regulation. There's a lot of financial repression that has happened uh, since the close of the financial crisis. Uh, there was, would have been a time, say, a couple of years ago, if you were a large bank, holding Greek bonds would have been riskless. Lending to a main corporate credit in the U.S. would have required a great deal of capital. It seems a little odd. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks.